Okay. Well, thanks very much for the invitation. It's uh, uh, it's a great pleasure to be able to talk and to see this great group of uh, people gathered in the hall there. Um, even on this small picture, I can recognise some familiar faces and uh, it's lovely to see you all. I might begin a little bit laterally by saying that over the years uh, in dealing, which I have done reasonably often with various museums, archives and so on, um, I've discovered one word that galvanises every curator. The word provenance. Put bluntly, good provenance, they're interested. Bad provenance, or worse, no provenance, no interest whatsoever. Now, in a small way, each of us is uh, running, who collect anyway, is running our own small museum. Um, and it's my belief has been for years that we should be paying much more attention um, to provenance, uh, even if it's only for the most venal of reasons, which is dollar value. Increasingly, it is the provenance which is going to lend and retain the value to your collection. And a part of that provenance comes with history. The particular history of a given artefact, um, as well as the general history of its period and uh, the culture that surrounds it. And there's no period more fascinating uh, to the radio buff than the beginnings of radio broadcast. Our own Australian early radio history is peppered with terrific characters. And by some strokes of good fortune, as well as uh, the result of research, um, I've managed to gain some kind of personal connection with three of what I regard as the greatest characters of uh, our early radio. As you'll see with each of them, I've uh, tried to latch onto anything that brings history to life. Now, let me see if I can work this magic machine to produce a picture for you. Here we go. Many of you um, will know the name of Oswald Francis Mingay. Here he is in prosperous later life, um, sporting the obligatory pipe, you notice down here of the 1940s and 50s. Um, Ozzy Mingay was responsible for a great deal, but he began humbly enough uh, as a junior, as a telegraph boy, I'm sorry, in the Lithgow PMG in Western New South Wales. And by 1914, he'd become a junior mechanic in their education department. And then war broke out. Um, come on, here we go. Here's the First World War embarkation role for Oswald Francis Mingay. And you'll see that he joined up in November 1915, initially as a gunner uh, in field artillery, but very quickly he managed to uh, switch horses in midstream, so to speak. And for most of the war, he worked uh, with second division signals, uh, first in Egypt and then later for an extended period on the Western Front. After the armistice, he worked again with GPO engineers in London and he came back home absolutely fired up for radio. He was a very active man and soon 
Um, he was wireless columnist for the Daily Telegraph as Lieutenant Mingay in the CMF. He was secretary of the Military Wireless Association. Um, and uh, all the while, he had a full-time job with Cecil Bergen at Bergen Electric. But Osmond Gay, particularly in his early career, didn't seem to stay in one place very long. And during this period in the early 20s, he watched as Ernest Fisk manoeuvred first of all privately with William Morris Hughes, Billy Hughes, uh, and then with the wider federal government um, for an AWA broadcasting monopoly and in some areas a monopoly in manufacturing as well. At a crucial moment in these negotiations, Ozzy Minge announced via his Daily Telegraph column that a full program of experimental broadcast would be conducted from his Taramara home in March 1923. Now, Fisk saw this as the opportunity to um, express his desire and uh, to exercise his power. And uh, the uh, AWA lawyers um, brought down a sledgehammer response on this modest initiative of Ozzy Minge. Unfortunately for Fisk, this response forced Fisk to show his hand and he had to uh, reveal really what his intentions and AWA's hopes were. Uh, and the uh, ferment of debate that followed that climaxed uh, in this broadcasting conference, which we've got pictured on the screen here at the moment. Um, and it was at this conference that AWA's overreach would become apparent and it would actually set the scene for a great deal of what was to follow. I love this picture. It's a, an old picture on newsprint, of course, but I love it because it is so symbolic of what was going on with, you can see the diminutive figure of Osmingue here at one end of the front table and way at the other end of the front table, although you will barely see his face, I will bring it up a bit, is the never photogenic Ernest Fisk. And uh, the fact of them sitting at uh, extreme opposite ends of this table gives some sort of a representation of the part that Minge played in those uh, early debates. Now, by uh, 1925, um, Minge had, first of all, left Bergen, then joined Harrington's, then left Harrington's, and this picture comes in a 1925 Wireless Weekly article announcing that he has formed Minge's Wireless Manufacturing Limited. Now, like so many of these early manufacturing efforts, it founded fairly quickly, though it wasn't through a lack of uh, extravagant publicity. This is classic Minge, indeed a revelation in radio. And, uh, you'll notice that uh, his Super 5 was different from every other Super 5 on the market. The Minge, unique Super 5. Uh, in fact, uh, as we shall see, um, it, there was nothing very unique about it at all. It was a standard TRF. Um, its only unique feature being this hulking great back battery box, which <laughs> enabled Osmingo to advertise the set as portable. I wouldn't have wanted to be the porter. I don't know about you. Minge's Wireless Manufacturing Limited failed soon after. 
Unfortunately, we don't have time to follow um, Aussie's very colourful career through this period. Suffice it to say that through a complex series of initiatives and buyouts, he became the country's premier publisher of trade magazines and information. This would preoccupy him for the rest of his working life. Here he is very cheerfully at his office in uh, later years. This working life culminated in the formation uh, of an organisation with about 40 staff. Its umbrella company, known as Australian Radio Publications Limited, became the centre and the focus of radio trade publishing uh, in this country. John Stokes, in one of his books, which you'll be familiar with, uh, made the comment that present day ra uh, vintage radio enthusiasts owe a lot to Mr. Mingay for recording almost every facet of Australia's radio history in his encyclopedic series of the Radio Trade Annual of Australia. Ray Kelly uh, wrote, we had an interesting exchange in the 90s about Mingay. And uh, he wrote to me sometime in the mid 90s, more than anybody else, he recorded Australian radio manufacturing, manufacturing history. I'm sure this was not done with us in mind, but it does not lessen the debt we owe him. At his retirement, Osminge was widely honoured and celebrated. And uh, we can see in this old picture again, he's being honoured and congratulated by Sir Lionel Hook, the chair of AWA, and uh, being presented also with a lovely uh, painting. So he was widely known, widely respected, and often amused many uh, in the industry. Now, I also had an interest in Osminge because um, in the 1960s, through an unexpected set of circumstances, I came to know the retired Osminge and his lovely wife, Winifred, very well. Um, and I have a, a photo to prove it. Here we are. Um, he's obvious, so is she, and this bloke here with the hair, you may not recognise, but I promise you, it is me. We're celebrating um, Aussie's 73rd birthday at the then newly opened Summit Restaurant in the heart of Sydney. It was brand new. It was a big adventure for us all, really, to go up to the top of that Australia Square building and have lunch in that restaurant. I've got many memories of them both. Um, they were a really interesting couple. They played Scrabble together every night. It was a fierce contest. She was probably slightly better than he was, but he was always determined to win. He talked often about his um, philosophies of business and so on to me. And um, he explained, I can remember in one extended conversation, how in his company, Mingay's Electrical Enterprises, um, he gave every new employee a bundle of shares in the company. That was one of the perks of joining the company. Then he had a sort of um, informal board, I suppose you'd call it, of five himself, two from middle management and two from the floor. They would meet every Monday morning. Each had an equal vote and all major decisions in the company were made at that meeting. And he said to me, having explained all this, and you know what? We didn't have a day's industrial strife in 40 years which 
is believable given those circumstances. And all of this, I think, before the phrase industrial democracy had even been invented. What a character was Oz Mingay. My second choice was also a keystone figure in those formative days of early radio. Now, let me say a little bit about Charles Danzy McClurkin. He was a remarkable fellow with a remarkable mother, Hannah McClurkin, as she became, was born to the owners of a gold rush pub in Western New South Wales. By her teenage years, they'd moved to Queensland and she was the, the effective manager of their big hotel in Toowoomba. By the age of uh, mid thirties, at least, let's say, Hannah had married, she'd had a couple of children, she'd written what became a world famous cookery book, she'd become widowed, and she had become the sole owner of Queen's Hotel in Townsville. And now she remarried Master Mariner S.D. McClurkin. I wonder how daunted Mr. McClurkin was by his overachieving wife, because it wasn't long before she had another brainwave and they moved to Sydney so she could take up a lease on the rundown Wentworth Family Hotel near the rocks in Sydney's CBD. Whether this was all too much for Mr McClurkin Senior, history doesn't record, but alas, he too died in 1903. Undaunted, Hannah set about refurbishing the Wentworth. And slowly she turned a 19th century boarding house into the benchmark hotel for Sydney. It was a magnet um, for the social set of Sydney right throughout the, 19, the late teens, the 20s, the 30s. Back to Charles. His interest in radio, um, I can tell you a little bit about his early interest, but it was the roof of the Wentworth Hotel that inspired him to put up a big antenna and a radio shack uh, and begin transmission there. Um, he, his early experiments, I've got the quote here somewhere, um, from an interview in a 1922 Wireless Weekly, he said, my wireless experiments date back to 1908 or 09. There were very few experimenters in those days. I might never have taken it up. Only Jack Pike and I were both keen on the same girl, and he seemed to be getting more of her attention than I thought warranted. I therefore decided to set about making noises like a spark gap to sidetrack her. I didn't succeed. But anyway, she married someone else, so it turned out all right. He went on on his um, rooftop uh, studio um, to rebuild it after a fire destroyed it and much else on the top floor of the Wentworth in 1911. Another two stories were added by the enterprising Hammer, and so um, Charles could now say, the aerial once more became a familiar landmark in Sydney as an umbrella type. It was then 49 feet higher up in the world. The set consisted of a clap Eastern half kilowatt high tone transmitter, plus what was, I think, the first valve receiver used in Australia. It used one of the original DeForest audions, pear-shaped with a tiny flat plate and grid. 
It blue glowed on the slightest provocation, but nevertheless was a great improvement on the crystal. There's no time for discussing the rather interesting wartime role that Charles McClurkin played, um, but we must move on quickly to the early 20s um, when he first really became a household name as uh, radio telephony began to take hold. McClurkin seems never to have been short of money and his equipment was always the best. Now living in Agnes Street, Strathfield, he set up what the Evening News Wireless Handbook called the best equipped of any amateur station in the Southern Hemisphere. His 2CM call sign would quickly become known worldwide, beginning spectacularly in 1921 with a message to Britain and King George V from the wireless experimenters of Australia. His license to broadcast was the first issued in this country, handwritten and signed by the Prime Minister, Billy Hughes. And until station 2SB, soon to become 2BL, began official broadcast in late 1923, 2CM put out a concert of music and entertainment every Sunday night for 90 minutes. McClurkin became the doyen of amateurs across the country. Faded photos give some idea of the scale of McClurkin's operation. Alas, not lots can be seen of the wiring of the antenna, but at least you can see the mask. Um, he was a quirky man with a great sense of humour. And that was one of the things that attracted people to his broadcasts. He used to tell jokes and make uh, quite idiosyncratic comments, which had people laughing at the other end. There's a record of uh, one listener uh, with his earphones firmly fixed to his crystal set at Burwood, rocking back at one of uh, McClurkin's jokes, falling off his stool and pulling his uh, crystal set and all down onto the floor with him. Apparently transmission was interrupted just briefly. Um, but as far as this uh, antenna and so on was concerned, as a joke one night, he inserted a copper toilet system ball between the lead in and the horizontal wires of his antenna. And within days, it was being mimicked all around Sydney. Everyone believed that McClurkin had absolute, had stumbled onto a fantastic way to improve the performance of your antenna. He used to love driving around and seeing all the uh, uh, system balls attached to antennas around the country. Uh, a later report, which I think we've got here somewhere, um, gives you some idea of um, the awe in which McClurkin's uh, broadcasts were held. This comes from the Wireless Weekly um, in September 23. 2CM was next. By this stage, others had joined the Sunday night broadcast. There is no need to say that this test was excellent. The strength was remarkable and is by far the loudest and strongest transmission of music that has been given so far. Mr McClurkin was in good form and his renderings of the vamp, the hero, etc., to say nothing of his last remark when closing down were most entertaining. One of his Sunday night broadcasts featured the lead in a musical comedy that was then playing in Sydney. In uh, February 23, Josie Melville, not a very flattering photograph, um, was claimed to be the first artist to broadcast live in Australia. And when McClurkin asked anyone who'd enjoyed the performance to write 
um, the Agnes Street letterbox was jammed with 2,000 letters in that week. Now, that's something which um, Patricia Carvelis on Radio National this mor uh, in mornings would give their eye teeth to receive in a month. It gives some feeling of the keenness with which uh, these early broadcasts were attended to and responded to. Um, he lent his name, McClurkin, to all sorts of uh, commercial enterprises. Here's a radio um, put out by Colville Moore, um, which they called the Chaz McClurkin Receiver. And um, perhaps unlike Aussie Mingays, it really did have some rather good features. I'd be very interested in an aside uh, if anyone has ever seen an example of this receiver. I haven't, and I've never heard tell of one, but I'd be interested uh, to hear if anyone has heard of that. Um, it was ultimately, however, um, his work as an amateur, improving and extending performance um, that was McClurkin's real interest, had been from the start and really remained so uh, towards uh, the latter part of his radio career. This is a, a little extract from an April 1924 edition of uh, the big ma American magazine, uh, Popular Broadcast. And it reports a record for, low, for distance with low power. Um, his 1923 tests with the Kiwi, Frank Bell, to establish um, a, a record for long distance transmission at uh, extraordinarily low levels of power, obviously made world news, according to an announcement by the American Radio Relay League, Mr. C. D. McClurkin of Sydney, do you like the spelling of Sydney, Australia, has succeeded in transmitting signals to New Zealand a distance of 1400 miles with an antenna input of only 0 0.004 watts, which is far less than the power produced by a burning match. Now McClurkin um, was uh, intrigued by the possibilities of the short wave band, uh, let's say below uh, two or three hundred metres. And uh, in early 1924, he embarked on the steamship Tahiti for a trip to San Francisco. The attraction being he was able to put up a radio shack and antenna on deck and with the temporary call sign 2CDM he again began to establish extraordinary records for transmission and reception and this carefully kept log still in the family records every day and every contact of that extraordinary trip. Um, it's impossible to exaggerate really McClurkin's influence on the radio community in the 1920s, right through. In long articles, in club reports, in ads, in letters, in testimonials, in interviews, and especially in technical reports, he's absolutely everywhere across the main journals of the 1920s. And uh, you can't, you can barely open one without coming across his name. He was uh, a towering figure in the day. And uh, it was uh, fitting, of course, that um, later in life, this is in 1943, he was made an honorary life member uh, of the Institute of Radio Engineers. More fitting still than that, um, on his rather premature death in 1957, was the decision by the Federal Administration to set aside his call sign marked never to be reissued. 
And that was a lovely tribute, I thought, to McClurkin. I'm going to stop the sharing just there, Kevin, and come back to the screen for a minute. While I share with you the spin out for me, when uh, in, I think about 2010, that one of our radio fests here in Canberra, um, an unassuming man approached me with a box of radio bits under his arm, extended his hand and said, how do you do? I'm Charles McClurkin. I uh, was a little bit taken aback and I said, I, 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 said I, 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 I hope you don't mind me saying this, but uh, you're supposed to be dead. And uh, he smiled and said, oh, you're thinking of my grandfather, Charles McClurkin. He said, these are some bits that were left over after he died, which I've gathered together, and I wondered if you'd be interested in them. Would I what? Um, the radio fest stopped at that point for me, and uh, I spent a wonderful 10 or 15 minutes with Charles McClurkin III, and uh, uh, there may be a little bit more to tell of that a little bit later. Now, my third figure of the period is, I think, in many ways, the most remarkable figure of this period of radio in Australia. No, I'm not talking about Sir Ernest Fisk. Indeed, I'm not talking about any other man. It is a quietly spoken, unassuming lady by the name of Florence Violet Wallace. Born in the same year as Charles McClurkin in Melbourne, you'll be glad to know. You'll be sorry to hear that shortly after her family moved to Austinmere on the New South Wales south coast. Coincidentally, where Lawrence Hargraves conducted his really interesting exper experiments with box kites. Whether that affected her, um, I don't know. But by 1904, she'd been enrolled as a scholarship girl at the prestigious uh, Sydney Girls High School, but she was already experimenting with electromechanical gadgets setting up lights in dark cupboards for her nearsighted mother with switches activated by opening doors. In an interview decades later, she said, I decided then I'd become an electrical engineer. After uni and a teaching stint, she applied to the relevant all-male electrical engineering department at Sydney Tech College. A principal very perplexed by being confronted by a female applicant thought he could head all this off by telling her that she had to be an electrical contractor before she could enrol. He'd, he had underestimated this softly spoken little lady. She was only, incidentally, five feet tall. Florence had business cards printed and looked for tenders. In that same later interview, she said, there was a house way out beyond Marrickville. Now, of course, an inner city suburb. There was a house way out beyond Marrickville asking for prices to install light and power no one else was silly enough to go way out there, and that was my first job. Needless to say, she did the job, went back to tech with the invoices and receipts from that job, qualified, and became Australia's first female electrical engineer. Now, already, even at this stage, she was interested in wireless. And by 1921, we find her electrical business, which was in Sydney's um, Royal Arcade, and we find it stocked with more radio bits and pieces 
than um, electrical cables and uh, electrical fittings. Now, um, we're going to find a... Yes, here we go. Her picture first emerges here on the cover of a very early edition of Wireless Weekly, September 1922. The magazine, incidentally, it turns out, and the idea for it were all hatched in her workshop between uh, F. V. Wallace and the two other principals uh, in its initiation. But here we see the demure Miss Wallace, already competent in Morse, taking down messages with a very neat little Remler outfit. That outfit would be a collector's dream today. Already, it was clear to the industry that F. V. Wallace was lots more than a cover girl for a magazine. This fuzzy picture of a crowd waiting for opening time at the wireless shop, Miss F. V. Wallace, electrical engineer, um, says it all. One of our foundation members, Rick Haviot, who some of you will have known, he recalled this mecca from his own boyhood, as he told me years ago. Miss Wallace, as he said, was always crowded. And I seem to remember her helping out the penurious with second-hand parts. She also produced a number of circuits complete with instruction details to give away to eager customers. Here's one from a later period, um, which is another Wallace booklet. She obviously put them out uh, in numbers. This was one on modern AC circuits, so this will be a late 20s, early 30s one. But it was the kind of information that this tiny lady delighted in sharing. And a bit like Charles McClurkin, all the while her interest in amateur work continued. She was fated the world over. Here she is looking as demure as ever, featured in Hugo Gernsback's Radio News. At that time, the biggest radio magazine in the world. The qualifications speak for themselves. She is, they say, the only one of her sex holding an engineering degree in Australia. She is a qualified electrical engineer as the reproduction of her diploma asserts and a radio fan to boot. She's the only member of the Wireless Institute of Australia. She's on the committee of the Electrical Engineers Association and treasurer of the Metropolitan Radio Club. In 1923, another young engineer came into the store with a very sad tale. Wallace had imported a rather rare and very expensive valve, I never found out what it was, for this gentleman from America, which he'd taken home, put on the table, it had rolled off immediately and shattered. Again, remembering this incident, she said later, he looked so miserable that I burst into tears. He told me later that he wanted to marry me. And a year later, he did. And thus she became Miss F, uh, I'm sorry, Mrs. F. V. Mackenzie, while Miss Wallace's radio shop continued, thrived and expanded under her maiden name over its banner logo, which we can see here in a later advertisement the wireless shop, the oldest radio firm in town. The oldest radio firm in town was her signal um, advertising jingle. Meanwhile, determined to bring other 
women into the esoteric world of the electron. In 1934, she founded the Electrical Association for Women, a society with regular meetings, its own logo and literature, and devoted to introducing women to the world of radio and wider matters electrical. Now, the association finally settled on premises in Clarence Street, where she held lectures and demonstrations. By 1936, this had so consumed her that she sold the oldest radio firm in town to Radio House in Sydney. And now the women's work could begin in earnest. Here was one of their early productions. The, you can see, Electrical Women's Association cookery book. I guard this, uh, the only copy I've seen of it with my life. Um, it's not particularly well preserved, but it is complete. And it reveals uh, what uh, she wanted uh, her women to read. It was a cookery book and electrical guide. And it introduces women to basic concepts of electricity, as well as advertising an electric kitchen, which means freedom. So this was uh, the work that she carried on in those later 30s. At the same time, um, of course, the Führer in Germany was carrying on slightly different work. Um, and when um, Mrs. Mackenzie, or Mrs. Mack, as she was becoming known, saw, watched Neville Chamberlain wave his futile white piece of paper, um, she began training some of her electrical women in Morse at the Women's Association uh, rooms, which they had set up in a rather rundown building in Clarence Street, Sydney. The course actually became comprehensive with every aspect of visual signalling included as well as more as Morse. Never one to let the grass grow under her feet, she established a new group called the Women's Emergency Signalling Corps complete with uniforms. And here she is uh, in charge of this group, which she formed herself, this uh, semi-military, I suppose, organisation, we'd call it, the Women's Emergency Signalling Corps. It's worth pointing out that everything, the premises, the equipment, the training, the uniforms, everything came from the Mackenzie bank balance. She understood its value as war work, providing uh, operators, female operators, to relieve hundreds of um, PMG male post office telegraph operators uh, for service overseas. But she also saw, and this is what makes her in many ways a woman before her time, she also saw how it would introduce a new generation of women to other career possibilities. And uh, this generation, of course, knew her simply as Mrs. Mack. And now for her next challenge, Mrs. Mack set out to convince the top naval brass of the need for a woman's Royal Australian Naval Service. Early in the war, she had several meetings with a very sceptical uh, senior military group. It is a long story with many twists and turns, but the Rands owed their existence to her persistence. Now, meanwhile, back at Clarence Street, her unorthodox teaching methods were producing fantastic results. Her girls, as she called them, often 
outperformed seasoned male operators, and soon the inevitable happened. A young would-be airman was knocked back for service because of his poor Morse skills. And he arrived at 10 Clarence Street and rather sheepishly in this all-female domain asked for help. In very short order, the place became packed with airmen first, then with men from all the services, and ultimately men from naval services around the world who were docked in Sydney, and most importantly, thousands of US servicemen who passed through Sydney learned their morse at number 10 Clarence Street. It is a wonderful picture, and I hope I've got the right one here, there we go, to see these smartly dressed um, American servicemen marching into the Women's Emergency Signal Corps upstairs at number 10. Once again, all of this she financed from her own purse would never accept payment. And by war's end, 3,000 women and 10,000 servicemen had been trained by her very effective method. And so it continued. Once again, in the later interview, she remembered, I trained nearly all the Qantas pilots for 10 years after the war. Little wonder she was honoured with an OBE. And finally, once again, a personal touch. I mentioned Rick Haviot's connection with Miss Wallace's store in the 1920s. Rick lived until he died in Hunters Hill, a Sydney suburb adjacent to the suburb of Greenwich Hill, where Mrs Mack lived for her entire married life. After she died in 1982, an alert friend of Rick Haviat's who also lived nearby, noticed a pile of stuff left out on the footpath for the council to pick up outside Mrs. Mack's home. And this enterprising soul rescued, there we go, this is what he found. We're looking at the inside of a Grebe CR-13. It was a premier shortwave receiver designed and released by Alfred Grebe in 1923, specifically for amateur work, amateur shortwave work. It's tuned to an 80 to 300 metre band. And Miss Wallace had clearly imported one of these and kept it for a long lifetime. Not long before she died, I was lucky enough uh, to acquire this radio and to uh, buy it from Rick in a lovely piece of symmetry. That box of Charles McClurkin's at the 2010 Radio Fest included this lovely pair of Nathaniel Baldwin headphones from 1922. As an American friend of mine is wont to say, the best phones that ever came down the pike. And they are indeed, they're terrific headphones. Nothing but the best for Charles McClurkin. And hasn't it been lovely to unite these two great figures Miss F. V. Wallace and Charles McClurkin with this little display a hundred years later. Thank you all very much for your attention.
Well, thank you, Richard. That was, um, um, I'm always speechless. It's unusual for me. Um, I'd just like to pay tribute to the people you spoke about, but also to the thoroughness and depth of your research. Uh, I wasn't expecting to find out that much about the spectacular early history of Australian radio. Um, and I really, really do thank you. And I think everybody else does. Did we like that? Thank you again, Richard. And look, um, I will take a couple of questions if anybody has. Uh, yes, just a sec. Um, Rob. I'm just wondering if this will be on YouTube. Um, I'd like to see it again sometime. I know it's been recorded. Uh, yes, um, we'll organise and we'll put a link on our website. Um, anyone else? Rob. Um, with respect to Mr. Mingay, I don't suppose you have copies of his publication that he put out in the 60s uh, for uh, radio shops and so forth, would you? I, I have very little, actually, of um, Oz Mingay's. I have none of the radio trade annuals. I auction them regularly at uh, auctions here and further afield. Um, they always make very good money. They're obviously highly sought after. But um, I've got a bundle of letters from Mrs Mingay, if you want to see theirs, but they don't tell us much about radio. Um, and the only thing I have is uh, there's a little book, I think, which uh, many of you will have seen, which is a very handy little book of tips. I think it's just titled something like Mingay's Wireless Topics or a title something like that. But um, unfortunately, apart from that, I have nothing but memories and I wish I had memories of having quizzed Aussie in detail about his 1920s experiences. Provenance once again. Thank you. Anyone else? Okay, all right. I say one, yes. I'd just like to mention also, someone was asking about the talk being repeated. Uh, that's fine. Um, but if you are interested in any of these figures, there are extended accounts, which I did, I don't know, probably 10 years ago, maybe 15 years ago. I can look them up and, and give people um, you know, days and dates in radio waves, but there are um, much fuller accounts um, of each of their stories in early editions of radio waves, um, and uh, you can you, you can pick those up fairly easily. But I should have mentioned um, that there has been a book written, a biography of Mrs. Mack of F. V. Wallace. Uh, I don't know the chap's name, someone there might know it, and I have not yet myself seen the book, but I look forward to it. It's, uh, uh, sh she's a, a person eminently worth, you know, biographising, if that's a word. Um, it is now. Um, <laughs> that's a word, come on. Um, so, uh, yes, thank you, Richard. I was aware you had some articles a while ago, so uh, if people want to track those down in Radio Waves, go to the website, uh, across the top, Radio Waves or magazine or something. If you open that up, You'll get a list, but you will then find a search box. And if you put Richard Begbie in there, you'll get a list of all of Richard's articles that have been published in Radio Waves. And that's probably a quicker way than having to pick out 40 issues and flip through the content. So website, Radio Waves magazine, search box, Richard Begbie, and that will get you through to the list. Okay, any final comments from any of the audience? Uh, yes, yeah, just a minute. Well done, Richard. Thank you. Um, my name's Michael. Um, the book you're talking about is called Radio Girl by David Duffy. And um, I've read it and it's a fantastic read and highly recommend it to anybody. It's well available online. So. Wonderful. Thanks, Michael. That's terrific. Thank and uh, I look forward to reading it myself. Oh, uh, yeah. So it's called Radio Girl. 
Yep. Okay. Um, and you should be able to find it online. And I think I'm going to get one myself. All right. Um, look, thank you again to Richard. Um, that was, yeah, that was pretty good. And uh, also thank you to Kevin for the hosting. Uh, I reckon it's time for afternoon tea and uh, we'll have afternoon tea and then we'll have the mini auction. Thank you again, Richard and um, Kevin.